November 1988, Palace of Justice, Pretoria. After three and a half years, Judgment Day. In this, the longest running political trial in South Africa's history. Delivering his six volume, 1,521 page judgment, Judge Kiers van Dijkhorst acquits 11 of the 22 accused of treason in the so named Delmas treason trial. Handing down sentence three weeks later, the judge gives six of the 11 found guilty suspended sentences. Of the remaining five, the three UDF leaders, Popo Malefe, Mos Chikani, and Terry Lakota, are sentenced to 10, 10, and 12 years, respectively. South African Council of Churches field worker Tom Mantata is given six years, while Val Civic Association youth leader Pina Malindi receives a five year sentence. Emotions run high as a final prophetic message of hope from those convicted is read to the court. Somewhere in the future lies a date when black and white will take a second look at these moments of our history. Outside, 15-year-old Masichaba Lakota weeps at the prospect of her father going back to Robben Island. There was a picture of her in the front page of the Star, where she was standing at the corner of the street crying alone there. That's something that stayed with me and I think it was some experience for my daughter. Masi Chaba does not weep alone. Inside the courtroom, tears stream down the cheeks of veteran advocate for the defense, George Bezos. Judge Van Dijkhorst, on the other hand, seems not quite so moved. The judge, obviously having seen me uh, in tears, he said, but cowboys don't cry, do they? I uh, uttered uh, uh, in a stage whisper for him to hear, I've never wanted to be a good cowboy. For George, it's a poignant moment, sharing as he does the bittersweet secret of an undisclosed love affair between accused Gina Malindi and defense attorney Caroline Nichols, who at the time of sentencing is about to give birth to their baby daughter, Lindiwa. When Malindi's child was born, uh, on the very same day that my first grandchild was born. George is the person that she went to first to say Gina and I are involved and in addition I'm pregnant. You know for, for an attorney to fall in love with one of the accused and uh, have a child. And I became the godfather of Lindy where the, the daughter, their first daughter. So for me it was an emotional thing, I make no secret. This is Delmos, situated off the beaten track some 70 kilometers east of Johannesburg. Out of sight, out of mind was definitely the thinking by the authorities for this choice. It was here on the 16th of October 1985 that the Delmos treason trial began, in the magistrate's court of the small town predominantly Afrikaner farming community that would ultimately give its name to this extraordinary chapter of South African history. The events that precipitated the trial began some distance from Delmos a few years earlier. In August 1983, the United Democratic Front was launched in direct opposition to the government's so-called new constitution. This new constitution was designed to entice coloreds and Indians offering them limited rights in a new two-tiered tricameral parliament. In addition, black local authorities, under the control of puppet black councillors, would run the lives of those blacks permitted to reside in the townships. That is the first and primary reason why we reject the Constitution Act. We reject it, as I have already said, because it entrenches our party. This would effectively create a buffer of one or two million complicit coloreds, Indians and urban blacks between white South Africa and the black majority. Now it disturbs me when people... At the same time, the government would resolutely complete its Bantustan policy, 
designed to strip the black majority of all citizenship and political rights in 86% of South Africa. This trade-off was the essence of the new constitution. Within a year, the UDF had mobilized a groundswell of grassroots opposition across the country. It was an all-round mobilization of all institutions, all organizations, because we wanted really the opposition to the constitutional program to be uh, the opposition by the masses of our people. We had been holding meetings, talking to people about the implementation of the program of the United Democratic Front, which was to render constitutional proposals unworkable. Tumahola, black township outside the conservative free state town of Perez, scene of the first spark to ignite resistance to the oppressive consequences of the new constitution. On July 1st, 1984, rent increases are instituted on an already destitute community by the black councillors. Supported by the UDF, the Tumahola Students' Organization mobilized the community to march in protest. The march begins in an area subsequently dubbed Beirut. Away with councillors, away with rent increases, are the placards carried in peaceful protest that day. Confronted by police firing tear gas, the marchers flee for their lives and the mood changes. A supermarket, funeral parlour and butchery, all belonging to privileged black councillors, are looted and burned. Accused number 20, Publicity Secretary of the UDF, Terra Lakota, on his way to the protest, is detained by police at a roadblock at the entrance to the township. So when I ultimately arrived uh, late in the day, the march uh, had already been disrupted by the police. And in fact, they had been, for the better part of the afternoon, they had been running battles between the uh, police and the youth. Once Tumahole, this had happened in Tumahole, and uh, there were rentals uh, and, and other uh, problems in the valley or just over the river. It spread that way, but Tumahole was really the spark. Across the Val River on the 12th of August, Father Jeff Masalani accused number three organizes a meeting at St. Cyprian's Anglican Church for the community of Sharpville to discuss their opposition to the rent increases. The Sharpville community are largely destitute and Father Mosolani is active in organizing emergency relief and community gardening schemes in the grounds of his parish. More people were asking for food parcels and then I saw that, I mean, how about us coming to talk about what affects them? But then other people, their friends, heard that there's this whole thing about talking about rentals from the other churches, from the community, who decided to come and join us here in the meetings. A week later, Father Mosolani invites South African Council of Churches field worker, Tom Mantata, accused number 16, to address a follow-up meeting. To tell you in no uncertain terms that Defense will always be there for you. I got into the Val on the invita per invitation by Jeff Marcelan, that is the rector of St. Cyprian Anglican Church. Um, he was dishing out um, food parcels to older persons who were subsisting exclusively on, on their pension. By the 26th of August, the community of Sharpville have resolved not to pay the increase in rents and to get legal assistance via the South African Council of Churches to take the Lakoa Black Local Authority to court. I was not interested in a match. I was interested in taking the Lakoa Town Council to court. What motivated me was uh, the whole issue of uh, um, that social responsibility of the church, that um, we as priests will have to see to the needs, address the needs of people. And I saw that, that um, it was not political, but kind of church related. Preaching to them and not giving them anything um, was contrary to the gospel. We must test that. That's right. 
That same day, two other communities, meeting at St. Michael's Church in Boipatong, and here at the small farms Roman Catholic Church in Everton take similar decisions. In addition, a stay away and protest march is planned for Monday the 3rd of September. Gina Melindi, Vol Youth Leader and Accused Number 5, is one of the coordinators of the march that set out from Small Farms Catholic Church on the morning of Monday the 3rd of September, 1984. It was a huge meeting. Um, a lot of us had not expected such support. And as after the people were addressed at this, uh, at this meeting, then the march started. But resentment by the community at increased oppression, brought about by the complicity of black councillors, was already erupting in violence. As the march entered Sebokeng, on the road ahead, a councillor's house was already in flames. We then had to take a decision whether we call off the march at that point or whether we proceed. And the decision that was taken was that um, we should proceed with the march because if we called it off, it could, have, it could be said that we only intended to lead it up to Zone 11 to kill a councillor and then disperse. Dispersed by police, the marchers never reached their intended destination. Across the way, Sharpville and Boipatong erupted in bloody violence. Businesses and homes of councillors were attacked and set on fire. As the Val erupted, five councillors lost their lives. Father Masalani was not in Sharpville that day. He was attending the Anglican Church Synod in Johannesburg. On hearing the news, he rushed back to the township. Tires were burning. There was just a bit of lots of chaos. People were running around. And I heard that well when I arrived here that Mr. Jamini, the late Jamini was one of the councillors, has been killed. And some of them who were here have left the, the township. It was very sad. To, to see that people can kill each other out of a system that they didn't create. In the months that followed, security forces threw armed cordons around townships countrywide. A state of emergency followed. The final phase of the revolution against apartheid oppression had begun. South Africa was never the same again. The 3rd of September, was the, the spark of the, the beginning of the end of the apartheid regime. With the state of emergency firmly in place, the regime set about building its case against the UDF. Three members of the leadership were arrested, as well as 18 activists and one priest all linked to events that took place in the Val during August and September 1984. I actually remember the day when the police and soldiers came to our house and they took my dad away. You know, it was a very, it was a cold winter's morning and it was very early. We hadn't even woken up. You know, we heard noises outside. Our youngest child, Huizi, was eight months old. They started searching the house. The children woke up and found these strange men in their home, speaking in Africans. There were Caspers outside as well, and I just I couldn't understand what was going on. And they led us to my parents' room, and at the, looking through some of his possessions, especially in his wardrobe, and I couldn't understand what they were looking for, you know? They were looking for, they were, I think mainly they were looking for books. In retrospect, that, that's what I realized. But I, I couldn't understand why they were going through his cupboard looking for stuff. And we were just sent off to school afterwards. And it's just really, I, I never really understood what had happened. They left with the, ho with the house surrounded by police. And uh, that was a painful thing. 
and uh, not knowing how long, how next, when next they will be able to see their dead. And this was the, um, the beginning of the Delmas Treason Trial. The Delmas Treason Trial commenced on the 16th of October 1985. The state's intention was to prove a conspiracy by the UDF to overthrow the government by violent revolution. In the process, they were determined to link key players and their organizations associated with the unrest of the 3rd of September as complicit in this conspiracy. The 22 accused faced charges of treason, subversion, terrorism and murder. I must say that right from the beginning of the trial, as I said to the judge in the course of the case, I hadn't come to plead not guilty for fighting apartheid. I plead not guilty to treason, but I plead guilty to opposing apartheid. The state built its case on the nine public meetings held at churches in Boipatong, Sharpville and Everton in the run-up to September the 3rd. For the accused, their very lives depended on interpretation by the judge as to whether or not they had incited violence when they addressed these meetings. The gravity of their situation was brought home early on with the sentencing to death of the so-named Sharpville Six in 1985. These were six people in the crowd found responsible for the mob murder of Sharpville councillor Jacob Jlamini on September 3rd. They were sentenced to death under common purpose. When the Sharpville Six were given set death sentence, and these were the people who were in the meeting that I addressed. Okay, I may not know, I may not have known what is it they did during the march or what is it they did in organizing the march. I may not know even whether they could have been party to the murders and so on. But the fact that I could have incited them, you know, was itself a pointer, which actually, you know, even made one feel that, you know, uh, if they go, why can't we go? If we, they can be given death sentence, how, how sure that we cannot be given death sentence either? As the trial dragged on, at the end of every day, the accused were driven some 20 kilometers back to Modabi prison, where they were held on the outskirts of Benoni. I never did understand why I would have to go see my dad at a prison. Uh, you know, that, that, that just used to tick me off, especially because of the trip that it involved, you know, and we didn't have a comfortable car. It was just, it was really a mission to get there. And, you know, just going through the whole security check, everything, you know, it was just, it really was a headache. And only to see him behind bars or no, behind a glass pane and only speak to him through some sort of walkie-talkie device. It was really quite painful. We just expressed our concern when he was coming out and, you know, were they treating him right, you know? He wasn't getting sick or anything. Because I remember um, he'd had a lot of encounters with the police and the system, you know, before he actually went into prison. You know, at marches like Regina Mundi, when he went to Regina Mundi once, you know, he was... He was assaulted by the police and he was whipped. And I'd always ask myself, you know, whether he'd make it in there, you know, whether he was built for prison. What actually nearly broke me was when I learned that uh, uh, because I had left that house, you know, not fenced and whatnot and so on, you know, how difficult it was, you know, in terms of security, you know, at home, you know, knowing exactly what was you know, what the security police were capable of. I remember at some stage we got a bulletproof door at my house, you know? I mean, I, <laughs> as strange as it sounds, I mean, it just, it really blew my mind. I was thinking, okay, why do we need to make contingencies with a bulletproof door? I think it was difficult for them um, uh, to take this as normal. They did see it as abnormal because Children of their age would talk about their fathers being at home, doing this with daddy over the weekend. But with these, there was no father. As a result, they took my father to be their, you know, their dad, much as they called him grandpa. But I know the youngest, Huizi, really thought that my father was her father. Uh, to a point when, um, when I took her over once to visit Tom, the child just screamed. She just didn't know who this man was. 
and uh, held on to my dad and said, Papa, you know, um, Tom was a stranger. I did think he was dad, yes. Um, he was the father figure at the time. Unlike Feng and Kuma, they knew dad, I didn't. So um, instantly I thought he was my father. Even at, uh, when they attended uh, trials, you know, she would not come to me. Here is the daughter, you know, uh, loved and uh, uh, getting that scared of a daddy who's the other side of the box. And, uh, you know, you would say, by the time I come out, you know, will she ever remember or all what she will remember was, you know, this monster who was behind bars and so on. When you look at your family collapsing, your marriage collapsing, uh, going to the ruins, and you sitting there helplessly, not able to do anything, um, that was the law. For Terra Lakata, a real low point in the trial was the 30th of April 1986. This was the day the state produced as damning witness Charlotte Slale from Tumahole. Charlotte testified that Terra had met with students at her mother's black joint tavern, instructed them on how to make petrol bombs and encouraged them to seek revenge on sellout black councillors. They brought this young lady. She, must say she was about 17 at the time. I had never seen her. I didn't know her. Um, and she led evidence to the effect that uh, somebody had come to Tumahole and taught them to make petrol bombs and in fact uh, instigated them to go and kill one of the councillors there, uh, Mr. Salele, in fact, was it. Unbeknown to the court, Charlotte had been detained in solitary confinement for some 18 months and the security police had coerced her into making this charge. She had in fact never met Lakata. The security police showed her photographs and told her to ask the judge to instruct the accused seated on the bench to smile. She would then recognize Lakata by the characteristic gap between his two front teeth. Then the judge asked me whether I could identify Tara Lakata from the 22 accused seated in the courtroom. I asked the judge to instruct all of the accused to smile. I then identified Terra Lakata by his smile as the one who had done these things. I must say that it was a very gloomy day because uh, actually at the end of the day George uh, drew my attention to the fact that this was so serious, you know, that if this evidence was not uh, disproved convincingly, and then I would find myself at the gallows. In the shadow of the gallows, Fortune smiled on Terra Lakata. Alone in her cell that night, Charlotte wrestled with her conscience. At great risk, the next day in court, she disclosed how she had been forced by the security police and leading prosecutor in the trial, Deputy Attorney General Mr. Jacobs, to fabricate this damning evidence. That night I thought about how wrong this all was and I told the court how I had been forced to say these things that were in fact not true. And then she said, but everything that I've said about Mr. Lakota isn't the truth. They have put me up with all to this. Well, the judge was absolutely devastated. In contrast, there were lighter and happier moments. In June 1986, accused number four, Lazarus More, married his sweetheart, Golda Mafisa. The judge's bench served as the altar. His wife baked the two-tiered wedding cake. It was a gala affair. Archbishop Desmond Tutu and representative for the Archbishop of Canterbury, Terry Waite, were two on the guest list. I was in love with with, with, with Gwalda for quite some time. And uh, we're then planning to, you know, to get married. Uh, it then, unfortunately, I was then, you know, shot. I was then detained. And subsequently, I was then, you know, charged with treason. And, and probably the best way for her and for myself 
to show this passion, the love, and the closeness was to celebrate our, our, our wedding on, you know, during my trial. And, and it, was, it was very nice. And uh, even, even the judge was there, you know, to celebrate with me, to be part and parcel of, 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 of that, that wedding. On the 30th of June, 1987, after three gruelling years of detention, bail was finally granted to all, save the three UDF leaders, Mos Chikani, Popa Malefe and Tara Lakata. It was a moment of bittersweet triumph in the trial. It was also farewell to Delmos. When the trial resumed some six weeks later, it was at the Palace of Justice in Pretoria. If the judge could, on occasion, be seen to be unusually harsh towards any one of the accused, it was to number five, Grina Melindi. During our attempts to go out on bail on one occasion, uh, when the legal team approached the prosecutors and said, but why are you keeping accused number five? I mean, he's only done X, Y, Z, give him bail. And uh, they were told, no, no, no. Accused number five um, is one of those that we want the death penalty uh, for. In the dock, Gina was asked to relate a painful incident he had experienced as a young boy. It concerned his father. Because of the pass laws, at the time, Gina's father was not permitted to be in Everton where Gina was living with his mother. When inspectors banged on their door, to save his father from arrest, Gina was forced to deny him, something that has remained with him ever since. He actually had to deny that his father was his father when the inspectors came there and said, who is this? And the mother was insisting that he was merely a visitor so that he wouldn't be arrested under the Urban Areas Act. And the inspector saw him, he was nine years old then or something, and said, who is that? Pointing to his father and he said, I don't know. And when he related that in the witness box, tears came down his eyes. Seemingly, the judge was not so moved. And in his judgment, somewhat caustically, he wrote, it is useful to sketch a profile of accused number five. He is now 28 years old and grew up in a poor family in Everton, where his parents were residing illegally. They were consequently frequently arrested. He, number five, still bears a grudge about it. With the state seeking the death penalty, Gina's case needed priority attention. In the latter half of 1987, Gina and defense lawyer Caroline Nichols were brought into a close working relationship. Caroline had long been friendly with accused number 13, Simon Cordy, who was now experiencing homophobic reaction as his homosexuality became known to his fellow accused. I said, who can I speak to that you really trust? And he then said, no, you must speak to Tlena, because he's the only one who understands me and accepts me for what I am. I was sort of fascinated to, to find out why this guy who'd been ex had exactly the same upbringing as everyone else, township upbringing, very poverty stricken, had such uh, enlightened views on science situation and on homosexuality and enlightened views on, on everything and was so tolerant generally. Her presence could not escape me. It's, she was there and it just struck me that, that she was there. Unbeknown to all except Simon and George Bezos, out on bail, Dina and Caroline lived happily together as the trial trudged on through 1988. Their bliss was rudely shattered when quite unexpectedly, the judge revoked bail for eight of the accused. As Dina was taken back into custody, Caroline was eight months pregnant. And the main thing he wanted was to be present at the birth of the baby. And that was the thing that really upset him. In fact, the day, the afternoon before their bail was revoked, we went shopping and he bought all these teddy bears and clothes for the baby. Uh, so I think also he knew in his heart of hearts that maybe he was going to be convicted. Once convicted, Gina, Moss, Tom, Popo and Terra, the so-called Delmas Five, were held at Pretoria Prison. 
For at Grina it was a particularly anxious time as he desperately wanted to see and hold his newborn baby before being shipped to Robben Island. We knew more or less when the baby would come and the longer I stayed in Pretoria, the more hopeful I became that I would see the baby before going to Robben Island. I came out of the hospital on the Sunday and I knew that he was desperate to see the child and to hold the baby. So on the Monday, I made an appointment with the prison. At that stage, they were still at Pretoria Central. And uh, they told us that it would be difficult that Monday, and they, but I should come on the Tuesday. So I went on the Tuesday, and when I arrived on the Tuesday, they told us that they'd moved them to Robben Island at five o'clock that morning. So I, I was incredibly upset. Undaunted, Caroline decided there and then that the only thing to do was to organize a client attorney visit to Kina on the island, taking little one-week-old Lindiwa with her. So when she was nine days old, he did manage to see her and he did manage to hold her. And uh, I just, it was, actually was an incredible sense of relief once I'd done that. I thought, well, now he's, he's done that. <laughs> um, at least when he comes out of prison, it won't be a situation of never having held his baby. As I knew thereafter that she'd have to go and have family visits, and that's behind the glass. For the first time, I had the opportunity of uh, seeing Lindy where, when I was already on Robin Island during this legal consultation. It was the first time that I could hold her, uh, pass her on to the other four comrades. Uh, it, was, it was very emotional. Um, uh, for me, I, I don't remember f how much of the consultation uh, I contributed to uh, because my, all my attention was on this new baby. With the trial now over, the defence team worked feverishly on the appeal, which hinged on a mere legal technicality. Early in the trial, Judge Kiers van Dekost had accused one of the two assessors, Professor Willem Jobert, of liberal bias. Without recourse, the judge then dismissed Professor Joubert. It was on this technicality that the outcome of the appeal depended. It was now January 1989. The hearing was set for Bloemfontein Supreme Court the 27th of November later that year. As with Popo and Moss, Terra Lakota had been denied bail for the entire five-year period since his arrest. He was now facing a further 12-year sentence. This was not his first encounter with Robben Island. From 1975, he had served six years after conviction in the so-named Sasso trials. At the time, children of political prisoners were only allowed to visit the island up to the age of three. Thereafter, they had to wait until they turned 16. It was out of deep concern for this forced separation of political prisoners from their children that Terra began writing his book, Prison Letters to a Daughter, as a way of communicating with his daughter, Masi Chaba. In the circumstances, you can imagine uh, uh, the gap that would be there, that children would not know their parents. And uh, it was a, a source of deep concern uh, on the part of many prisoners that uh, these children uh, might uh, be alienated from our generation. And uh, so uh, we had to find various ways to communicate with them, to make them understand that in spite of uh, the road we had chosen to take, in spite of prioritizing the struggle, they must not understand that they're worth nothing and that they're not valuable. But even more important that we should find a way to share with them some of the elements of why the struggle was important and why they themselves should embrace it. As I said to her in one of uh, the early letters, you must share this with your friends and most important, with those who will grow up clutching the hems of your skirts, uh, her own children. Of course, it's history that now my daughter, of course, passed on herself. Tragically, Masi Chaba died in her late teens. At home with her younger brother, Kotane, in 1990, with Terra away serving his second term on the island, Masichaba spoke of her deep admiration for her father and his dedication to the struggle. 
keeps on doing it he doesn't get tired he knows what happened inside the jail but it doesn't matter to him as long as he's fighting and he's never given up though though he knows it's hard to leave us as a family alone but then he goes on fighting i, I think he is a hero For Barbara Mantata, her visits to Tom brought back dark memories. Her father, Philip Matthews, was sentenced at the historic Rivonia trial to 12 years on Robben Island in 1963. From age 16, traveling with her mother, Rebecca, Barbara once a year visited her father. Now, 15 years later, she would visit her husband, Tom. The child age law had since changed, and she was able to bring Kumo and Fenya aged 13 and 9 at the time. It was a very bumpy ride, and because we were black, we weren't allowed to go inside the ship and sit inside. And that was only for white people. And it was sad because, you know, there was a point I remember where we were going and I was quite feeling seasick. And I was always asking my mom, can I go and sit down, you know? And she was like, hold on, everything's okay, we'll get there, you know? I really hated the trip. I mean, it was just, it was long. It was, goodness, it was just, it was mean as well, you know? The, the sea was just, I think, I think it was the first time I had an encounter with the sea. And going there on that little ferry and, goodness, the waves. And then eventually getting there, and just being subjected to speaking to him behind at last pain. It was just really, and it was so impersonal. I mean, I was asking stuff like, are you okay? Uh, and you know, as a kid, I was just, I was very withdrawn because I just, I couldn't pour out my emotions there because it was just so impersonal and the time was limited and there were these prison guards walking up and down. And I just, I, I just couldn't bring it to myself to be able to just really pour out and speak genuinely and just say, What's going on? <laughs> you know, what are you doing here? When are you coming back? Those memories again came back to one. Strong memories um, of, 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 of your visits when you were the age of 16, when you started visiting Robben Island, when I first visited my father. And looking at the prison, looking at the walls, looking at all sorts of things and saying, oh, we, this is where we used to come. And there it's happening again. It, it was really something remarkable for me. And that I shared with my children. I shared it with my children and I said, this is what I used to do with Granny. We used to come here. Every December we knew this is what. So it clearly is going to be the same thing that mommy had to experience as a young kid and 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 I managed I coped with this clearly they were hurting inside and all you could do was just to support and say it's not that bad he's alive he's here we can talk to him others don't have their daddies anymore I never liked the way they kept us they kept us in a room a small a very small room and um, the place was not so nice, and the toilets had no toilet papers, or the weird toilets. It's horrible, but I liked um, visiting Danny and speaking to him and all stuff. I was very excited to in the same, and I, was, and I was very happy because it was a long time, but then I'd really forgotten his facial looks because he had uh, gained a bit more than he was. Like, I was very happy to, 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 to be with him, and I, and I just wished I could be with him forever. But as time went on, um, it was becoming clear that there is, the, the, uh, there is a good chance that they will win the appeal. And of course, that was a, a bonus. But again, you, you learned to, to restrain yourself and say, you know, hold on because the last thing you ever want is to break and having to break uh, in front of your children. So you need to be strong. For him, your husband inside, for the children and for yourself. I can only think what she felt, you know. I, I can't actually say, you know, but she had to have been very strong. 
um, yeah, it must have been hard, yeah. On the 27th of November 1989, the appeal was heard in the Bloemfontein Supreme Court. In support of their five comrades on the island, the 17 acquitted made the journey with family and friends to Bloemfontein. It is certainly a very important development in the hearing of the case as a whole. It would be a shattering thing if a whole trial, which lasted about four years, had to turn the end on a simple point of law, whether the assessor was or was not rightly dismissed. I will feel that I've been vindicated because I feel most unhappy about uh, the procedure adopted in this case. I felt it was unkind, unfair, and my position was it was defamatory of myself and, I must add, of the senior counsel for the defence. It was a fatal mistake. And also it hurt uh, Professor Joubert. On the 15th of December, 1989, Professor Willem Joubert was vindicated. The appeal was successfully upheld, and quite incredibly, the entire proceedings of the three and a half year Delmas treason trial were dismissed. 15th of December, 1989. Judgment was handed down on that day. I was really taken by surprise. I was on the tennis court uh, playing tennis and um, suddenly these comrades rushed to me and picked me up and told me I was going home and they held me shoulder high out of the tennis courts into the courtyard and there was noise in other cells and Popo, Terra and Moss and Tom and Tata were also being carried to our cells to pack. It, it came so quickly, uh, so suddenly, that it didn't even give us time to really say goodbye to a number of our comrades and so on. But, but it was great. And uh, when we got to the waterfront, I still uh, pinched myself to really, you know, believe that, you know, we were going on our way going home. All I could see on television was uh, at the airport, the, the excitement, and here with these guys with their green suits, prison suits, out, and my children being, <laughs> being part of the crowd, young as they were, Huitu was actually being held right up there. I don't know where we were, but I know that um, Desmond Tutu's wife was carrying me, and I was crying, and there were just all these people. It's a very vivid memory, I can't remember exactly. I don't know what was going on, but yeah. When they came in, there was just joy, you know? Everybody was chanting slogans, everybody was happy, and I was just so happy to see them. And they were carried, you know, like shoulder high, and we were just celebrating. It was a, a joyous moment indeed for all of us. And then there was my little Tina. Uh, with her mother and my lawyer Priscilla Jana and there were songs there, people singing, carrying us high up on their shoulders. Uh, it was a, like really a great hero's welcome. It was, it was great. Uh, it was marvelous. I saw Caroline and the baby and, uh, and for some reason she got into an altercation with one of the police and she was arrested for allegedly assaulting one of them. <laughs> and I was arrested, that's right. I got arrested for, for kicking a white policeman in the balls. It was a high for the whole country. It wasn't just a high for me personally. It was, a, it was just part of this role, this new political era that South Africa was entering. Election, you felt justified for what you have done. You regretted the wasted effort. You regretted the punishment that they served uh, on Robben Island. You can't stop believing in the judiciary. He says, uh, criticize it, destroy it, if you will, 
but never stopped believing in it. We were accused by purists that by doing these political trials we were lending legitimacy to the uh, apartheid regime. I said, you know, I will stop acting for people in political trials when they or their mothers or their fathers or their sisters or their brothers stop asking me to do it. I don't think they can, they can afford your, the intellectual heights that you are walking on. They are holding the knife by the sharp edge and I think we must respect their decision. After the trial, the Mantata family spent four years in the UK. There, as a family unit, they were able to successfully reconcile Hwetzi's feelings of estrangement towards Tom. Back in South Africa, Tom was appointed to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and is currently serving a second term with the Human Rights Commission. Father Jeff Mossolani occasionally visits his old parish, St. Cyprian's Anglican Church in Sharpville. Continuing his service to the community, he is now chaplain ministering to the inmates of Sun City Prison in Johannesburg. Gina and Caroline were married in May 1990 and today have three daughters, Lindiwa, Zaria and Zanella. Gina studied law and has his own legal practice. Well, Lindy is certainly like any other South African teenager, probably with a slightly better developed social conscience, but uh, certainly... I suppose you just get bored with your parents saying, well, in my day, this is how things were. You are very lucky. <laughs> I think I'm just like any other South African kid. Um, obviously, I have more insight because of my parents, but I mean, I don't think that makes me any different. Um, maybe a little bit more understanding to the situation, but, you know, pretty much I'm just a normal kid. <laughs> I feel fulfilled. Um... The, there was a time when um, the future looked bleak and I had lost hope that my ambitions of achieving anything in life uh, would be fulfilled. But I am now a professional person and I have three children whose future I'm um, very uh, positive about. I think they would live uh, very fulfilling lives. I think uh, I'm a very fortunate person and uh, I'm happy with my life. Sadly, Simon and Cordy passed away after a long fight with HIV AIDS in December 1998. One of many casualties of the struggle a marriage made in Delmos, Lazarus and Golda are no longer together. That marriage never, never, never worked. And um, yes, I sometimes blame myself, blame myself in the following manners that it's, it's, it's unfortunate that we men, or we politicians, we tend, we tend to, you know, to marry the struggle rather than you know, marrying the loves, loves ones. Since democracy in South Africa, Popo Malefe has served two successful terms as Premier of the Northwest Province. Regrettably, his marriage fell victim to the strain of the trial. His son Puso has come through the difficult times well and has a close relationship with his father. Popo's daughter Tina, who was one month old when Popo was detained and taken away, has been nurtured and brought up by his attorney, Priscilla Jana. As a gesture of reconciliation, Popo held a reunion for all involved with the Delmas treason trial. It was also an occasion to thank the South African Council of Churches for their unflagging support given to all during the trial. Judge van Dekhorst accepted his invitation and even made a speech. At the time we saw each other, we did not hear each other, and because we did not hear each other, and especially from our side, because we did not hear, we became indifferent. And having become indifferent, we lived in two entirely separate worlds. Veteran human rights advocate George Bezos 
continues to answer the call where needed. Recently, he defended opposition leader Morgan Changarai facing treason charges in Zimbabwe. Tara Lakata was appointed Minister of Defence and lives with his wife and family in Bloemfontein. There's nothing to compare with the joy of concluding a struggle successful. Of reaching a day you can say, our people are free. There can be no substitute for this. The greatest single reward, whatever life might give or not give tomorrow, the pain, the tears, the blood, all of it cannot downplay the value of freedom. I think it was a very important era. Um, I wouldn't have the opportunities I have now if what occurred didn't occur. And for that, I think it was a very important era and it was something that had to be done. And I respect my father for that. <laughs>